For 5,000 years, it has stood in the silence of the Salisbury Plain, a broken ring of giants that has outlasted empires, religions, and civilizations. To the casual observer, Stonehenge is a postcard from the past, a static, silent ruin of moss and gray rock. We look at it and we see a cemetery, or perhaps a temple. We wonder how they moved the stones, and then we move on. But we have been looking at it wrong. For centuries, the true purpose of this monument has been obscured by the fog of time. We assume the builders were primitive, dragging rocks simply to mark a grave or worship the sun. But after years of high-tech scanning, chemical fingerprinting, and acoustic archaeology, the silence is finally breaking. What researchers have found buried in the invisible chemistry of the rock and the geometry of the circle isn't just a pile of stones. It is a machine, a device of terrifying precision that functioned as a celestial clock, a solar computer, and, perhaps most hauntingly, an acoustic amplifier designed to alter human consciousness. The story of how we cracked this code doesn't begin with a golden treasure or a dramatic excavation. It begins with the most boring object you could possibly imagine. A rock that sat in a box, ignored, and gathering dust for nearly 100 years. This is the story of the New All Boulder. If you ever needed proof that history hinges on the tiniest details, this is it. In the 1920s, during excavations that were effectively men in wool coats making educated guesses, a geologist named Robert Newall found a small lumpy stone. It wasn't a towering giant. It was barely the size of a football. It looked like trash. It was cataloged, boxed, and shoved into a museum storage room where it was forgotten for decades. But this rock, was a time bomb waiting for technology to catch up. Recently, scientists decided to slice into this forgotten fragment. When they looked at its chemical DNA, specifically the trace elements of thorium and zirconium, they didn't just find a rock, they found a map. For generations, a debate had raged in the archeological world. We knew the blue stones, the smaller stones in the inner circle, came from Wales, but how did they get there? One camp argued that glaciers moving like slow frozen rivers during the ice age had naturally push these rocks onto the plane. It was a theory of convenience. It meant the builders just used whatever debris nature had left behind. The Newall boulder destroyed that theory in an instant. The chemical fingerprint didn't just point to whales, generally. It pointed to a specific location, Craig Rousey Phelan, and it was an exact match. But more importantly, the stone showed absolutely no signs of being rolled by ice. No glacial scarring, no smoothing. This rock had been quarried. It had been ripped from the earth by human hands and dragged 140 miles across rivers, valleys, and forests. This wasn't nature. This was logistics. It was an organized, multi-generational mission that required a supply chain comparable to modern industrial projects. And if they went to that much trouble for the small stones, what about the giants? The massive uprights that form the iconic silhouette of Stonehenge are called sarsens. These are the titans. Some weigh 50 tons. They are silcretes sandstone hardened over millions of years until it is tougher than granite. For centuries, we assume these monsters came from the Marlboro Downs, just somewhere nearby. But somewhere isn't good enough for forensic science. The breakthrough came from a man named Robert Phillips. In 1958, during restoration work to re-erect a fallen trilithon, a drill core was removed from one of the stones. Phillips, a diamond cutter on the job, pocketed the core as a souvenir. He kept it in a plastic tube in his office and then his home for 60 years. Years. When he turned 90, he sent it back. That core allowed scientists to destroy a sample for testing, something they could never do to the standing monument. They vaporized tiny pieces of the stone to read its geochemical signature. The results were staggering. 50 of the 52 massive sarsens didn't just come from the same region, they came from the exact same spot, West Woods, 15 miles away. But here is the psychological insight that changes everything. West Woods wasn't the closest source of stone. There were massive rocks, much closer to the construction site, the builders ignored them. They walked past the convenient stones to get to West Woods. Why? Because they didn't want easy. They wanted perfect. They selected the biggest, most uniform stones, demanding a level of aesthetic perfection that made their job 10 times harder. This wasn't just construction, it was a statement of dominance. Dominance over the landscape and dominance over time itself. This brings us to the most radical new theory of all. If the materials were chosen with such obsessive care, what were they building? For a long time, we thought it was just 
just a ritual space, but Professor Timothy Darville has proposed that we are looking at something far more practical. He believes Stonehenge is a perpetual solar calendar, massive enough to be seen by the gods, but accurate enough to run an empire. The math is hiding in plain sight. Look at the Sarsen Circle. There are 30 upright stones. In the Neolithic world, a month was 30 days. The circle is a month. Each month is divided into three weeks of 10 days. But a year isn't three on 60 days. It's three and 65 and a quarter. The builders knew this. Inside the circle stands the Trilithon Horseshoe, five massive structures. These represent the five extra days of the year, the epagomenal days used for festivals and renewal. And the quarter day, the four station stones that form a rectangle around the site allowed them to track the sun and add a leap day every four years. If this theory holds, Stonehenge isn't a ruin. It is a prehistoric computer. It locked the society into a strict rhythm of time, telling them when to plant, when to harvest, and when to gather. In a world without writing, this structure was the manual. It was the state authority carved in rock. But a calendar only engages the eyes. New research shows that the builders were also engineering for the ears. Stonehenge is famous for its alignments with the sun. But what if I told you the monument was also designed to be a sound weapon? A team of acoustic engineers from the University of Salford decided to rebuild Stonehenge, not in the real world, but as a perfect 112 scale model called Mini Henge. They placed it in an anechoic chamber, a room with zero echo, and blasted it with ultrasonic frequencies to simulate how sound waves would have behaved 5,000 years ago when the circle was complete. The results were spine chilling. Today, Stonehenge is an open ruin. Sound bleeds away into the wind. But when the stones were intact, they functioned as a sound bubble. Inside the circle, the acoustics were amplified. The stones trapped sound energy, boosting the volume of a human voice by four decibels. It doesn't sound like much, but in a quiet prehistoric world, it would have been thunderous. A drummer or a chanter standing in the center would sound superhuman. But the real magic happened when you stepped outside. The moment you crossed the perimeter of the stones, the sound died. The monument was designed to keep sound in. This rewrites the social history of the site. It implies a hierarchy. The elite, the priests, the chosen few stood inside the circle, enveloped in a cacophony of amplified drumming and chanting, a psychedelic auditory experience. But the masses, the thousands of people who traveled for miles to be there, they stood outside. They could see the movement, they could see the rituals, but they could not hear the secrets. Stonehenge was a theater of exclusion. It was a machine designed to separate the powerful from the powerless. It is fascinating that long before we had lasers or acoustic modeling, we had myths that hinted at this strangeness. The legends of King Arthur tell us that the wizard Merlin used magic to fly these stones from Ireland, calling them the giant's dance. For centuries, we laughed at that story. Magic? Giants? But strip away the fantasy, and what is the core of the legend? It is the memory of stone stones being brought from a distant land across the sea. The myth remembered what history forgot. The stones were brought from the west. They were dragged by men who must have seemed like giants to those who watched. Today, Stonehenge is often treated as a bucket list item, a place to snap a selfie and leave. But when you understand the forensics, the picture changes. You see the sweat of thousands of people dragging the Newall boulder from Wales. You see the obsession of the architects rejecting the nearby rocks to haul the perfect sarsens from Westwoods. You hear the thrumming, amplified bass of drums trapped inside the circle, vibrating in the chests of the high priests. You see the shadow of the heelstone marking the passing of another leap year, keeping the civilization in perfect sync with the cosmos. It was never just a pile of rocks. It was a cathedral, a clock, and a concert hall all in one. It was a desperate, beautiful attempt by our ancestors to create something permanent in a world that is always fading away. And in a way, they succeeded. The wood has rotted. The people have turned to dust. The language they spoke is entirely lost. But the stones, the stones are still hanging. The next time you see that silhouette against the sky, ask yourself what other technologies are hidden in the ruins of the ancient world waiting for a laser or a microscope to wake them up. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the hidden history of the world's most famous monument, make sure you're subscribed. We are peeling back the layers of history, one mystery at a time, and you won't want to miss what's coming next. Thanks for watching.